Please welcome Dan Ash, Director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Wow. All right, it's now my honor to introduce to you the 50th Secretary of the Interior, Ken Salazar. Secretary Salazar is a great American. He's a great leader. He's a great conservationist. He's the visionary behind President Obama's campaign to conserve America's great outdoors. So please, give him a welcome that lets you know you and, and the United States Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Wildlife Refuge System and all our partners are behind his vision for the future. It's my honor to introduce you to Secretary of the Interior, Ken Salazar. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, all of you. Let me uh, first ask you all to join with me in giving your 16th director of the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, who was just confirmed by the United States Senate just about 10 days ago, Dan Ash, a round of applause yeah. for his <laughs> great leadership. Uh, I, cut, I cut a deal with uh, President Obama as a United States Senator. I said to him, hey, uh, I uh, love my job as a U.S. Senator, but I will run the Department of the Interior because I love its mission. And that mission, you saw a lot of it depicted by DeWitt Jones in his uh, extraordinary presentation uh, just a few minutes ago. But I also said to the President back then is that I get to choose the people that work at the Department of the Interior. And so, in choosing Dan Ash, I chose somebody from your ranks, somebody who has uh, labored long and hard, who has loved the Fish and Wildlife Service for all of his life. And still today, I don't know whether he's a Democrat or Republican. But I know one thing, he loves conservation, and he loves the best land and wildlife conserva conservation agency on the entire globe. Don't you agree that that's the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service? <laughs> uh, We have labored very hard on a very wonderful speech, and uh, I will hereby incorporate it by reference into all of my remarks, but I'm not going to read it, okay? <laughs> but it will be posted because it is, it is very good and it's taken a lot of uh, hard work and effort on the part of many uh, to pull it together. But let me uh, just uh, speak to you some from the heart. Some people may say to uh, me, you know, you have kind of a crazy uh, itinerary because you work in Washington, D.C., not too far from the White House, and uh, you're on your way to Montana, so why were you in Colorado yesterday and why are you back in Madison, Wisconsin today? You know, it's kind of like a U-turn or a circle and kind of a plane that's lost, so wh why are you here in Madison? Well, my answer to that is I'm here because I want to honor uh, all of you who are here. I want to honor the young people from throughout America who have come here to help us define the future for the Fish and Wildlife Service and the refuge system. So give them a round of applause because they're here from sea to shining sea. They join, they join the ranks of young people all across America who are making such a big difference in what is happening and will happen in conservation across America in the generations to come. They join the nearly 21,000 young people who we are now employing within the Department of Interior who are out there becoming the next conservation leaders of, Amer of America. They join great leaders like uh, Dan, uh, Dan Ash, who's here, Greg Sakenik, who asked me to come here about two months ago. As we were sitting in our office, he was uh, telling me, we we're, were having conversations about the Flint Hills and the Tall Grass Prairie and the Everglades and a whole host of other refuge initiatives that we have underway. And he said, Mr. Secretary, I only have one request of you, and that's that you come to our conference that we're having in Madison, Wisconsin. So give the manager of the refuge system a round of applause. It's why I'm here in Madison today. Thank you, Greg. 
And I'm here because of the states and uh, the great efforts that the states, as our partners, uh, continue to deliver on behalf of conservation around our country. And I'm here because of all the partners who are part of this, the sponsorship of this, great, uh, of this great program. I'm here because of the regional directors and uh, the nearly 10,000 people at the Fish and Wildlife Service who work every day on behalf of, of this agency. And I'm also here because uh, my good friend, uh, Sam Hamilton, would have wanted me to be here. Uh, all of you here in this room uh, probably knew Sam, and you know his legendary work on the landscape conservation cooperatives, uh, conflicts which he helped resolve in places like Texas at the Balcones Wildlife Refuge and a whole host of other matters that he worked on. But it is his vision which uh, we carry on. It is uh, his vision which Dan Ash and all of the employees uh, carry on here. So I'm here for all of those reasons, and I'm glad that I made the U-turn to come back to, to Madison, Wisconsin. Now, let me uh, just say I'm also here because Thad Allen is here. Where is Thad? Thad is here probably in the back somewhere. Okay, Thad Allen uh, you'll be hearing from shortly, but uh, he was our key point last year as we dealt with that horrific oil spill that really uh, was uh, perhaps uh, one of the biggest national crises that we will see in our time. And uh, working with him on uh, so many issues in the Gulf uh, gave me the highest respect for him, and I knew he was going to be here as well this morning. So you will be hearing from one of the greatest leaders uh, of America that really helped us uh, lead the country through a very troubled time, and so I'm very proud to be here with him. And so let me um, tell you why uh, I am so impressed uh, with uh, the vision that we have here today and why it is that I think conservation is very much at a crossroads uh, across America. And at the end of this conference, uh, my hope is that uh, all of you here who care about conservation and who care about making sure that the United States continues to lead as uh, the beacon of hope and possibility for conservation that can keep those aspirations alive that DeWitt uh, Jones so admirably depicted in his uh, photography. Uh, that, that crossroads is one that ultimately history will judge that in these very important times, it will fall on the side of those who care about our planet and who care about its, uh, about its, about its wildlife. Now, some may see what is happening in Washington, D.C. today, and it is a very troublesome time. It is a very troublesome time because of what is happening with respect to some of the budget cuts that are being proposed, uh, with respect to a paralysis that seems to have uh, beset uh, the, the nation and, and beset that city. And yet, through all that, my hope is that we will be inspired by those who have gone before us, who have done so much to give us a conservation legacy that we so much uh, enjoy here in our country today. Well, Doug Brinkley, I know, has spoken to you today. I've spent much time with Doug over the last couple of years. And he always reminds us about the great contribution that the wilderness warrior, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, gave to all of us uh, here in this country, the conservation legacy on which uh, we stand on today, the conservation legacy which is really looked on with uh, great envy by uh, all the other countries uh, around the world. And I'm reminded also that those who came before us have uh, weathered some very difficult times. Because it was in 1934 when uh, Franklin Roosevelt actually, uh, at the behest and request of uh, the Sportsmen of America, signed the legislation that created uh, the duck stamp. Now, some of you here will remember your history about 1934. And you will know that those were some of the darkest times in our nation, because it was then when the nation was engulfed in the most horrific economic crisis of our entire history. When most people did not think at that time in the midst of the Great Depression that we would ever be able to come out of that uh, huge economic crisis. And in those times, uh, not too far from here, but in the Kansas and Nebraska, Colorado and those areas, we were also encircled by the great dust bowl of those times. And so, notwithstanding that crisis that beset the nation in uh, the 1930s, it was the sportsmen of America who built on the conservation legacy that uh, Teddy Roosevelt had started and said, yes, even in these hard times, we can do some great things for our country. And so, all of us here today who care about conservation, who care about our 553 wildlife refuges, who care about the connectivity of our landscapes, who care about the protection of wildlife corridors in America, who care about the tall grass prairies, who care about the crown of the continent, who care about the headwaters of the Everglades, who care about our planet, frankly, can look back to that time and say, if they were able to do it then, we ought to be able to do it today. And we ought to be able to summon up the courage of the American people to stand up against some of what is being proposed in Washington, D.C., 
that would essentially emasculate the very heart of conservation for America today. And so while this conference here is a great conference because we're looking to the future of conservation, it's important also that this conference be a call to action, a call to action by the voices of conservation to our partners and our friends in the community who care about what we do in conservation. Because if this debate that is going on in Washington continues the way that it has started with the GOP-led effort in the House uh, Appropriations Committee, I will tell you that uh, conservation will be set back 50 years in this America. And because the concept that is on the table is to figure out this uh, deficit and debt reduction set of issues for a 10-year time frame, it's uh, an issue which will afflict us in the conservation community for, for a generation to come. So I hope that all of you stand up with me and with others who will be working very hard to make sure that the voices of the conservation community are heard loud and clear in Washington, uh, D.C. Now, as I make the argument about the importance of conservation, I tell people that, uh, yes, it is in these economic times that we ought to be pushing forward with conservation because we do a lot to help uh, the economy of America. We at the Department of Interior, through the programs and activities uh, that include the Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Parks and the BLM and our other agencies, we support over two million American jobs in this country alone. The outdoor recreation industry last year, uh, through its foundation, published a report that said we create over six and a half million jobs a year uh, in the American economy. The tourism and leisure part of our economy is one of the strongest pillars of the economy of the United States of America. And uh, we know that uh, visitors who uh, visit our wildlife refuges and who hunt and fish in this country contribute greatly to local communities. I know in some towns in places like Wyoming and in Montana where you have uh, hunters who go there every year that they have uh, unemployment rates that may be in these days maybe 7 to 11 percent. But without the great contribution of, the out, of outdoor recreation and hunters and anglers and rafters and others, what would happen is that uh, those unemployment rates would be as high as 20 percent in some of those communities. So there's a very real economic contribution that our wildlife refuges and the hunting heritage and sportsman heritage of America make to this country. So as we struggle with the economic times of America today, it's important for all of us always to say, yes, it's about conservation and taking care of our planet and our beautiful wildlife uh, species and making sure that we don't mess up this uh, planet that we inherited. But it's also important to remind people that in these times of crisis that this also is about uh, job creation. Here in Wisconsin alone, we all know the great outdoors heritage is a huge economic engine for this state. National parks, our refuges, our, our public lands generate more than $100 million in economic activity just to the state of Wisconsin, $100 million. And visitors uh, to just one of our places uh, in the Apostle Islands uh, uh, spend an average of $55 per person per visit in local communities on everything from sunscreen to hiking boots to fishing poles to fishing tackle. And we know that 1.4 million people visited Montana's National Wildlife Refuges and spent more than $42 million here uh, just uh, in the last year. And so when you look at some of those figures, uh, it's important that as we engage in this debate that uh, people understand that there is an economic uh, foundation for what we do in conservation. Now, as I look ahead and I look at the new approach to conservation that uh, Greg Sikanik and Dan Ash and our regional directors and all of you here, our partners, have been working on, it's uh, an agenda which is truly exciting. It is an agenda which is full of promise and hope for the future of conservation for America. When I think about the young people that are engaged from sea to shining sea, from Alaska to the Everglades and the work that we do, you can't help but be inspired by what these young people represent to America. We know they are the next generation of great conservationists for this country, and we know that they care. When I travel to places as I did not too long ago, in the Flint Hills of Kansas, where I sat there with Sam Brownback, uh, the former United States Senator and uh, the governor of the state of Kansas, along with the partners that we had there in the Flint Hills, I was struck by how it is that the people who were most important in that room that were helping us move the conservation agenda forward were the ranchers who actually own the lands at the Flint Hills. It was a fourth and fifth generation ranchers who were there, along with their 
sons and daughters and grandsons and granddaughters who said to me that without the National Conservation Agenda, without the National Conservation Area, the NCA, which was a collaboration, a collabor collaborate, uh, co cooperative with uh, those ranchers, that their way of life would be taken away from them. That they felt that the protection of the last remaining of the tall grass prairies, the 1.1 million acres in Kansas, was the most important thing that we could be doing on their behalf, on behalf of the ranching heritage of America. And so, as we sat around with uh, the Kansas Cattlemen's Association, the Livestock Association, the Nature Conservancy, and other groups who were there that day, I was so inspired by the huge collaboration which has made possible the protection and preservation of the last of the remaining of the tall grass prairies. In South Dakota, not too long ago, probably a month or so ago, I was uh, in a farm workshop where uh, Jim Falstich, who has a 6,000 acre ranch in the South Dakota grasslands, was there with all of his neighbors and with many organizations, including Ducks Unlimited, who has uh, made a challenge grant of $50 million to help us preserve the Dakota grasslands. And Jim Falstich said, the way of life that I care about, the preservation of my 6,000 acres and the preservation of uh, the other ranch lands here in South Dakota is so important because it's about our way of life. And yet here in South Dakota, he said, 50,000 acres of the tall grass prairie are being turned over every year. 50,000 acres are being turned over every year. Now I'm sure as I was there amidst the John Deere tractors and the equipment that he had in his shop that day with about 50 people who we met with, that many of those who were in that room in South Dakota were Republicans. And yet they embraced the ethic of conservation. Again, it's because what we do here, what we're talking about here on the future of wildlife really should not be a partisan issue. It should be a unifying issue. The same thing can be said where I will be uh, tomorrow and the next day in Montana, where the crown of the cotton and the continent and uh, the Swan Valley and other places that we're working on there to protect with the ranchers and uh, others who care so much about the crown of the cotton. That we're approaching conservation in a way where the United States is not necessarily buying up huge tracts of land, but what we're doing is we're working with those who own the land and are putting together with them the kind of conservation plan that will make sure that the conservation ethic is one that lives, but also at the same time that the way of life for those who depend on those areas survives. And it's the same, I could, I could tell you the same story with uh, the headwaters of the Everglades where the ranchers there have been so much a part of our effort. I could say the same thing about so many areas of our, of our wonderful country. And so the vision, which all of you have worked on for the last several years, which you've been talking about, is one which we're actually implementing on the ground. But it's also a vision which uh, today is uh, very much uh, threatened. It's very much threatened because of the, and I'll just say it out loud, I won't even ask for a show of hands here today about how many of you are Republican and how many of you are Democrat. It may be that 60% of you are Republican, 40% of you are Democrat, I don't know. But what I do know is what the GOP has done in their proposed Republican budget in the United States House of Representatives, which has already passed the Appropriations Committee, would set back what you and I care about so much in a way that we cannot afford to let it happen. And if you think I am kidding, let me just tell you what the Appropriations Committee did. It's not that the Republican-led GOP in the House, that they're bad people. They're wonderful people like uh, Representative Mike Simpson from Idaho, who actually cares about this issue and who understands that uh, what has happened in the hand that he was dealt in the House of Representatives is not a good way for us to go. So we need to make sure that we find our friends, and that at the end of the day, there are the votes for us to be able to make sure that we turn back the clock on what is happening with uh, some of these cuts. Now let me just tell you what a few of them are. Because I think most of you here would say, this is not what Teddy Roosevelt or Franklin Roosevelt or Stuart Udall would have stood up and said, this is what we ought to do. But when you have a budget which reduces state and tribal wildlife grants by 78%, 78%, a cut of $73 million, is that standing up and saying our planet and our land and wildlife is important? I think it's turning their backs to 
the ethic of conservation. When you have a budget that reduces the North American Wetlands Conservation Fund by 60%, by 60%, all of you know what NACWA has done to our country. You know, I sit on the Migratory Bird Conservation uh, Commission, along with my great friend Mark Pryor from Arkansas, and U.S. Senator Thad, Al uh, Thad Cochran from Mississippi, and several other members of the House of Representatives, and some of you who are in this room. I know that those investments give back a lot to conservation every year. And yet, NACWA is going to be reduced by 60%. Now, how about this one? The approved budget by the House Republican Appropriations Committee would eliminate all funding, all funding for new cooperative endangered species grants, and it would also eliminate all funding for neotropical migratory bird grants. Okay, so it would eliminate all funding. Is that standing up for the wilderness uh, warrior, Teddy Roosevelt, or for others who have the, created the kind of conservation ethic for our country. Um, when you continue to read through some of the rest of this, it is scary. It is downright scary. It reduces the habitat conservation programs, like the Partners and uh, for Wildlife Conservation Planning Assistance, by over $40 million. It eliminates all funding to manage the Endangered Species Act. Uh, and designation of critical habitat. It reduces the cooperative landscape conservation uh, cooperatives by $17 million below what we have requested. All of you here, I know because you're students of uh, what we do at the Department of the Interior, know that the landscape conservation cooperatives were an idea which Sam Hamilton championed and which uh, we uh, have created and are spreading across the country and they're doing very well and they're su supported by many states. And yet this budget would eliminate all the progress that we're making on LCCs. Now, I'll give you, I could, I have a whole list of these things, but it's kind of depressing, so I'll just leave you with one last depressing statistic, okay? I don't, I don't want to be the downer because I know it's been a, it's been one of those conferences where there's a lot of uh, good vibes going on in this house and all the way across the country as people are watching your, uh, kind of your, uh, your dialogues here. But I'm gonna give you this last statistic because I think it tells you what is happening in Washington, D.C. today. Under the House GOP proposal, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service would be cut $506 million below the request. Specifically, the part that relates to refuges, and a lot of this relates to refuges and the connectivity that we're trying to create, it would cut the refuge system by $48 million, which would result in an estimated loss of 800, over 800 employees within our fish and wildlife refuge system. Uh, you know, I've been to a lot of our refuges. I was with Sam Hamilton at uh, Pelican Island uh, about uh, two months before he passed away. And we we're putting down the slabs there at Pelican Island that demonstrated the progress that we continue to make in conservation. And I'm proud of the work we have done. I'm proud of the work that we envision. But as I've gone to many of our wildlife ref refuges, uh, I know what uh, our men and women who are there on behalf of conservation have to deal with. Sometimes we have two FTE who are responsible for multi-millions of acres in two or three different wildlife refuges. This is not a huge agency, and yet this budget would cut out over 800 FTEs from the workforce of the Fish and Wildlife Service. And we estimate that because of these cuts, the 40,000 volunteers who help us carry on the conservation ethic of America we also would not be able to support those 40,000 volunteers, and that we would end up closing 128 out of, our 100, out of our 553 U.S. Fish and Wildlife Refuges, closing down 128 of our wildlife refuges around the country. Now, I look at those statistics and I tell myself, you know, those aren't statistics. That's essentially what I call a turning around the clock on conservation in America. It's throwing out the legacy which uh, we have all built together, which many of us have invested a good portion of our life in making a reality. And it's not just our legacy, but it's also our future. Because when we invest in these kinds of programs, we know that we're investing in the conservation legacy of the United States for the future. And it also is not just about America, because as you know, wildlife does not know 
boundaries. And so when we talk about the NACWA program, we know that it's uh, about our birds throughout the uh, Western Hemisphere. And yet, those programs are targeted for elimination. So I've always approached my work as a United States Senator, as uh, Attorney General for my state for six years, as Secretary of Interior, as a way of trying to bring people together. And I can't think of a better way of bringing people together than the call to action that those statistics represent. Now, House Republicans and uh, the President are united on one point, and that is that we do have a fiscal crisis in our country, and we have to do something about it, and we have to tighten our belts. And so, yes, we at the Department of Interior and the Fish and Wildlife Service are doing our part. And so we have taken on, for example, the greatest uh, information technology transformation in the history of the Department of the Interior. And because of that transformation, we have produced half a billion dollars, $500 million in savings in the next 10-year window. We also are taking on a number of other efficiency initiatives to try to make sure that we are walking the talk of creating a lean and mean machine. But yet, these cuts by the House GOP go into the bone of the very essence of what we stand for in conservation. So I would hope that we continue to work with uh, people like Jeff Trandall at the United States Fish and Wildlife Foundation, so many others, who are making sure that the voice of conservation is one that is not forgotten, one whose voice is heard loud and clear in the halls of the United States Congress, in the offices of the Office of Management and Budget, in so many other places, because otherwise, the voice of conservation will be drowned out and the future of conservation will be run over. So while I throw out that challenge to all of you to understand the challenges that we face, I also want to tell you that I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful because when I sit down with uh, great conservation leaders like Norm Dix and uh, others who I have talked to. They know that uh, we are in probably the first quarter of uh, what's going to be a very tough budget fight. But we know that there's still some more steps to take. And as we move through that process, it is all of you who are here today and all the partners who see this as a unifying issue that will make sure that those voices of conservation are heard loud and clear. And let us remind people, and let us remind all of those in Washington, D.C. who run for elected office, that there are some 67 million voters who care about conservation. And there's an election that will come up, and they should be held accountable. So when I look at the sponsors of this conference, I'm optimistic that we'll be able to get something done. When you have Ducks Unlimited, and the Defenders of Wildlife, who I see here on the front row, joining together with the National Riflemen's Association, joining together with Dow, with Caterpillar, with Case, with Ford, with, with uh, Prairie Re uh, Restorations, with Marcel Day, with the Wilderness Society, with the Conservation Fund, with the Audubon, with the Congressional Sportsman Foundation, with the Association of Fish and Wildlife Service, with the National Wildlife Federation, with the Trust for Public Lands, with CARE, with the Nature Conservancy, and with the National Wildlife Refuge Association. I believe that voice will be heard in the halls of Congress. It's very interesting for me as I work on projects and issues all over this world, from sea to shining sea in America, that there are so many people who care about our agenda. And you know, when I was down in, as I have been now on two or three different occasions in uh, Big Bend uh, in uh, Texas, trying to figure out how we create a national conservation area on both sides of the border. The three million acres on uh, the Mexican side of the border and the one and a half million acres at Big Bend on this side of the border. Because we know the wildlife doesn't know that there's a boundary there and they go back and forth. And we ought to be able to manage that ecosystem as one. Some of our greatest supporters are some of the Republican ranchers who are in that area. And when I sit down and I talk to former First Lady Laura Bush, and she talks to me about the importance of 
the conservation ethic of America. I'm inspired by what it is that we can do with what ought to be a unifying agenda for this country. So I ask all of you to join us in moving the clock of progress in conservation forward. The President's budget for 2012 proposes full funding for the Land and Water Conservation Fund. That's the first time, second time in its entire history <laughs> that that happens. Now at $900 million a year, many of the dreams that you all have here, uh, we can make happen. If we can get some of the money that also needs to support NACWA and some of the other programs that I spoke about, we can make the dream of the future of wildlife happen. But yet, again, I am reminded of the reality that we deal with today. And that is that the Land and Water Conservation Fund has totally been eliminated in this House GOP budget. Totally eliminated. So I go from being euphoric on the one hand and know that at least we have a 2012 budget that would be good for the future of fish and wildlife as proposed by the President of the United States. And yet I see what we've run up against in the House of Representatives. And so your voices are important that they be heard. Now, let me just conclude by saying all of this. You know, for some people, when they ask me, why do I care so much? And why do I want us to move forward with a conservation ethic of America that we can be proud of? When you walk out the front doors of our ranch in the San Luis Valley, which I hope we are able to establish a national conservation area in one day, you look out to the west and you see the great Rocky Mountains of the San Juan Mountains, a wonderful oasis of wildlife and, and beauty. When you look to the east, you see the beautiful Sangre de Cristo Mountains, another ecosystem which just this morning I received a letter from one of the owners there who has over 135,000 acres of land saying to me and to others that he wants to place that into conservation and provide some public access because he believes in the ethic of conservation. So when I look at those places and I look at the rivers which uh, bisect and traverse our valley, the Rio Grande, the, uh, San, the Conejos River, the San Antonio River, I tell myself that this planet is too important for us not to take care of. I'm reminded often of the inspiration that we sometimes get as we walk around the front yard of America's capital, and that's our National Mall. One of my favorite memorials there is uh, the FDR Memorial. And one of uh, FDR's quotes and part of what helped us uh, take the country in those uh, 1930s through one of the most significant expansions of our wildlife refuge system and the creation of the duck stamp, FDR's quote, emblazoned on the walls of the FDR Memorial was that man and nature must work hand in hand. The throwing out of balance of the resources of nature throws out the balance also of the lives of man. So if Teddy Roosevelt, in the midst of the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl and the swirling clouds of a looming war could help us lead us through that conservation effort today. We, the voices here in this room today and across America, will help us lead us through this crisis as well. And I'm very confident that we will. And I'm very confident that we don't have a choice. Because if we let this time pass us by and we let the conservation legacy of America be buried, so too goes the conservation legacy of so many other countries who are starting their own efforts. I was in Brazil not too long ago, meeting with uh, the uh, environmental department there and with uh, the NGOs who do so much work in the Amazon and so many other places in Latin America. Nature Conservancy was there and they represented uh, 16 of the countries in uh, Central and South America. And they tell me from the highest levels of the Brazilian government that they look to us for their guidance. They want to be like us in the ethic of conservation. So we can't let the world down as we deal with uh, these times of crisis. But yet, there's so many stories that inspire us no matter uh, who we are and no matter where we go. There in that same meeting in Brazil, there was uh, a man now in his uh, 50s 
who had uh, been one of the lead persons in uh, the uh, rescue and restoration of the habitat for the golden tamarind monkey. And he said to me, I came to Brazil some 25 years ago, and I started working on uh, making sure that the monkey did not go extinct. And everybody here thought that I was crazy. The monkey was this uh, monkey that stunk. A monkey would spit on people. If you got close enough, the monkey would scratch people. He said, everybody hated the monkey. They all wanted the monkey dead. And many of them wanted me as dead as they wanted the monkey to be dead. He said, and 25 years later, something magical has happened here. What has happened is that uh, the farmers and the ranchers and the uh, city of Rio and other municipalities came to the understanding that uh, their way of life depended on us protecting the rivers and having a canopy on those rivers. And so the farmers and ranchers today are very happy with what we've been able to do to restore the habitat along these rivers. And the monkey, the monkey, though not yet totally loved by everybody, is actually thriving because the canopy that has created a connected habitat along those rivers has been restored. And so the monkey is now in a good place in Brazil. And so even in that story, I find inspiration that no matter how tough the odds seem at a particular point in time, they will turn. And so I leave you just with this final thought, and that is that uh, the work that you do is inspiring. It is inspiring because your cause and your dream have been a cause and a dream for a long time. Your cause and your dream have advanced over time, generation by generation. And your cause and your dream will not go away. It is mine and it is yours. It belongs to the young people who traveled from all over the country to be here in Madison, Wisconsin. It belongs to the men and women who have made the United States Fish and Wildlife Service the best land and wildlife conservation agency on our earth. Think about that, on our earth. It belongs to our partners in the state who labor away to try to do what they can at the state level. It belongs to our partners like Ducks Unlimited and the Nature Conservancy and the business community who give so much to the ethic of conservation. So that cause and that dream will live. And I am confident that as we go through these times of crisis in America, that we are on to something with the vision that you have all created. The connection of landscapes, whether it's the tall grass prairies or the Flint Hills or all the habitats that we have in America, the concept of landscape conservation cooperatives, those are all the causes that we care so much about. And I'm confident that our best days are still very much ahead in the era of conservation. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Ben. Good. How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you up there. <laughs> hey, Jane. Thank you. It's too somber. He came up and he got away. Oh. We lost him. <laughs> How can you lose? Good to see you up there. Aren't they good? They are good. Wow, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. So, what we are going to do, well, and I got to say one thing before we do this. We're going to ask a couple of questions perhaps here, but I get to experience day in and day out working with the Secretary of Interior that has such passion for the Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Wildlife Refuge System that I personally waited 25 years to see and experience. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so we were going to do about a 10-minute question and answer session here. We are not. We are going to ask the secretary, though, one question. I've been getting text messages and Twitter feeds. I can't believe I'm even saying this. <laughs> I believe it either. One question. Mr. Secretary, the Refuge Vision document talks about leadership and mentoring the next generation. How did you become a conservation leader? How did you get your conservation heart? My conservation heart really comes from uh, having been a, a rancher and farmer for most of my life. In fact, I was with my family down in the San Luis Valley just this weekend. 
And uh, you see the beauty of our planet, the, beautif the, the beauty of the wildlife that surrounds you when you're out there in the middle of the forest or in the middle of uh, the grasslands or the middle of the, of the, of the meadows. And in some ways, uh, ranchers have always been, in my view, some of the first uh, conservationists that we have. And that's because I believe most ranchers, and it's not all ranchers, but most ranchers understand that uh, protecting their uh, land and their water really is uh, the very essence of their own uh, economic survival. Because they know if they don't take care of their lands and their soil and their water, that they basically destroy the sustainability of their own way of life. And so that's really where uh, the roots for conservation for me come. I also frankly believe that, uh, yeah, I, I, I have faith. I believe in God. And I frankly think that uh, we are endowed by our creator with uh, assets here on this earth that uh, are so treasured that we ought not to uh, destroy them. You know, I'm uh, reminded of uh, the uh, uh, Grand Canyon and Teddy Roosevelt and uh, his comment as he stood there on uh, the rim of the Grand Canyon where I stood uh, a few weeks ago as we made a decision to try to protect a million acres, which is now, by the way, under threat. <laughs> but uh, we, uh, as I stood on, uh, on Mather Point there at the Grand Canyon, that uh, Teddy Roosevelt looking out at the Grand Canyon said, uh, some things uh, God has made so well that uh, human beings uh, should not touch it because they will mar it. Uh, and uh, yeah, so there's an inspiration there also, which uh, for me is uh, a duty which we all have as people who inhabit this planet, that as we use the planet, we also have to take care of it so that we can uh, continue to live in this uh, great gift uh, which we have been given. Wow. Thank you very much. Thank you.